Hey, and we're live with Rita Denoyer Garcia, author of the Self Compassion Project, as well as Becoming Awake, the YouTube channel, and also you can find her on becomingawake.com. I believe there is more to the title of that book. Unfortunately, I don't have it here in my little notes. Could you finish <laughs> me off with the, uh, sure. the, rest of the title of that book? It's the Self Compassion Project: How to Become Emotionally Stronger more effective and happier by giving yourself a break. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And how did you discover how to become more emotionally stronger, more effective and happier by giving yourself a break? Um, Because I tried everything else pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I grew up in um, a household, you know, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And so the mentality um, was very much, you know, you just you just work harder. If things aren't working out, work harder, keep your um, nose to the grindstone. Is that the expression? (laughs) I think so. Yeah. Just keep your eyes on the prize. Just keep going. And there's a lot of value to that, you know, persistence, determination. But one of the things I noticed is that uh, it was limiting to me. I got to the point in my life. um, I had three small children. I was trying to run a business at the same time, which is um, not so easy all the time. I like literally had toddlers on my knees as I was trying to close business. It was, it was kind of, you know, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And um, so I hired a coach to help me with my business because I thought that's what I need. I just need someone to help me close clients and then everything's good. And one of the first phone calls we had, um, I don't remember exactly what was going on, but apparently I was upset. And so he said to me, um, Rita, right now, just for this moment, can you just be really kind and gentle with yourself? And I thought, what? You know, how how, how is that going to do anything? How is that right. productive? This makes no sense to me. Even though I have a social work background and I've been kind and gentle with all sorts of people, strangers, family, all that stuff. But for myself, it was just never on the menu. Right. So, um, so my part of my brain was saying, was very skeptical to say the least. And then the other side just really surrendered to it. And I just started crying. I just started sobbing on the spot. And I knew, oh, damn it, this guy is making me cry. Now I have to work with him because yep. he's he's doing his work. And I, I just was so resistant at the same time. It was kind of such a mix up of different things. But anyway, oh, yeah. when I allowed myself to for that moment, I think maybe it was like, a minute or two of just feeling the kind and gentleness within myself. I noticed that I was no longer focused on all my failures, failures as what I perceive failures as a mother, as a businesswoman, as a, as a person, as a wife, as a sister, as a daughter. And I was just being kind and gentle. And it really obviously touched me on a deep level because I wrote this book, right. but, um, I realized, wow, this is a game changer. Like I felt a lot of relief in that, a lot of relief. And it only, it helped me come to a new starting point where I could, it's like when you go on an elimination diet, have you ever done that? Where you just start eliminating things from your, you start off with like nothing, like ice cubes practically. And then you start oh. bringing, well, not quite that way, but they, <laughs> they eliminate all the allergens and the things that could be bothering you. And then slowly you introduce one and another just to see where the sensitivities are. I kind of okay. felt like being completely kind and gentle with myself in that moment was kind of like I was eliminating all the stuff that I was doing. And then I could feel when something was right or not after that, like, right. Ooh, that feels a little off. Ooh, that I'm a little allergic to that. So so it was like kind of an emotional elimination diet, if you will. It just yeah. kind of gave me a new starting point. And um, and I was so intrigued by it that I worked with this guy for four years and he taught me tons of other things. But that was the one that was really, wow, I need to work with this guy. Yeah. And um, because it was a brand new concept. And I, I had been in therapy for seven years, Dylan, seven years. And I don't remember that coming up. And maybe it did. I just wasn't in the place to receive it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so that happened and that kind of led me down all these different new roads where I took a step back from my business, um, which I never thought I would do. Cause that means you're a quitter. You don't do that. 
right? And he's like, no, 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 you're not quitting. You're just taking a step back so that you can take care of yourself a little bit. And so we can look at all of these beliefs, all of these allergens, so to speak, yeah. limiting yeah. beliefs that you have and figure out which ones really work for you and which don't. And I was just like, I didn't even know I believed half the stuff that came up. You know what I mean? It's like going through the drain. You never put a snake down the drain and you're like, what the heck is that? How did that yeah. get down there? Yeah, It's clogging up the system. So it was really going, wow, I can't believe I've been carrying that around for all these years. And it started with just taking a breath and slowing down and just being kind and gentle. And then, of course, there were lots of other things that I did with him that allowed me to see what I was really believing, what was really driving me, um, what was really kind of mucking up my life. And then I could decide, do I want to revise that? Do I want to keep it? Do I want to chuck it? It was like doing a Marie Kondo on your beliefs. You know, this is yeah. bring me joy. This is spark joy. Do I want to put it back in my drawer or are you going to donate that one? <laughs> so, um, so I did this work with him for four years and I started noticing as I started to feel better, I started noticing all of the miserable moms in my neighborhood. You know, they're walking through Whole Foods, they're surrounded by the bounty of Whole Foods, and they're just like the walking dead, you know, with a cup of, with a latte and a baby Bjorn. They're just like zombies. And I thought, um, I feel better, so I'm going to reach out to them. And I started emailing my friends saying, I've discovered some stuff that's really helping me a lot. I feel so much better. Do you guys want to know about it? I want to share it with you. And three of those people said, yeah. And then we formed a group. And I, that was my first group. And I started working with them. And then, you know, went down different cul-de-sacs of different topics. But it all kept coming back to the self-compassion. Like, that was foundational for me. Like, this right. is where you start <clears throat> if you really want to make lasting change. This is, the, this is the question that keeps coming up. Can you be kind and gentle right. now? Can you be kind and gentle now? And... Um, so I ended up doing some research. I was my own guinea pig. I tried everything out on me. I developed a course called the Compassion Course, which I taught for a couple of years. And then one day, one of my students said, you know, you should really write a book about this. Yeah. And then that's where I decided, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. So it sounds like when you first, um, you know, you, you said you had that moment with your therapist where he brought up are you kind and gentle with yourself and you started to weep i mean to that point have you always been more like are you from a very practical family that doesn't get into emotions like is that something like <laughs> kind of like a foreign concept or you just what's what's the story there i would say we i was from a fairly conservative traditional family so dad didn't have a big emotional repertoire really he's still alive god bless him he's 97 we're going to be 97 hey. decent wonderful guy everyone loves him but his emotional range was not wide you know yeah. anger um irritation happiness joking an occasional i love you which is great that's better than a lot of people get right yeah but it wasn't my mother was more of the feeler she was more of the emotion and she was the emotional translator for my dad okay. so my dad would say something and my mom would say what your father means to say is <laughs> you know he's upset that blah 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 and i'm like why didn't he say that you know like well your father you know and i think that's a very kind of old-fashioned traditional way of being where the yeah. men are more emotionally limited and much more um action oriented right he was excellent provider, you know, working really hard, had his own business, did really well, very much provided for the family. But the the burden of being emotionally connected to everyone was really through my mom. OK. She also did a lot. Yeah. Like I appreciate now as a mother how much she did when before I was a mother, I was just like, yeah, mom, whatever. She's just a mom. And now <laughs> I'm like, I am not worthy. You know, I'd half the amount of children she had. And right. And I realized, wow, how did this lady do it this without becoming a complete alcoholic? Because, you know, and a lot of moms are, by the way. This is there's a correlation between moms and alcoholism. But anyway, um, she just did. She was I said she was like a mom, like an Olympian athlete. Like you watch her move and you go, oh, look at that. That's interesting. I could, I could try that. If you ever watch the Olympics and go, you know what, maybe I should start taking up skeet shooting or you know, maybe I should start swimming in the pool. And you realize you do one lap and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> curling always seems easy. But then I remember I can't <laughs> skate at all. Like, so right. Just trying right. to do the broom thing would not work. 
going to get the old toboggan out and try it out. Let's go at 60, 100 miles an hour. Um, so yeah. I realized she was kind of at this Olympian level where she made everything look easy. Yeah. But it actually wasn't, you know, like it took years for her to get these systems down and these coordinations, you know, where she's doing 15 things at once. Right. So, um, so I guess what I'm trying to answer your question is the, the women were a lot more emotional and the men were more stoic. And, um, and so dinner time was interesting. Um, my dad loved to bring a, a controversial topics. He loved talking politics at the dinner table. And um, so there was a lot of um, uh, crying and <laughs> anger yeah. and leaving the table at different parts of the evening. And at some point, some reconciliation. Um, but uh, I've learned that we don't talk politics at the dinner table in our house. It just, it doesn't go well. <laughs> so, um, and my mother would threaten to leave. She would sit at the, she was at one side of the table. My dad was at the other side and she would say, we are not talking politics at this table. And one day, and of course we did, right? So she just kind of like got steamrolled on that one. And then one day she just got up very quietly. She took her plate and she left and we were like, what's going on? And it finally dawned on us. Oh, she doesn't like that. She's leaving. <laughs> now you said she had twice as many children as you do. So you have several siblings. It sounds like. Yes. So I have five siblings. Okay. Um, four are alive. One is deceased. Mm. And uh, yeah. And, and kind of all over the East coast. Was there, is there quite a range in like opinions and emotions between you guys or do you find you're pretty similar in a lot of ways? There is a, there is a thread of commonality. Um, I would say uh, my sister who is living is very liberal. Um, I would say most of them are liberal. My brother's more conservative and I'm more independent. I'm more like, I, I like a little here, I like a little there. Um, yeah. Maybe in this environment, they would call me conservative because I'm not super woke or anything like that. But I consider myself, like in terms of politics, I'm independent. Do the, do the dinner conversations tend to stay pretty civil or can it get fairly heated? With my siblings, grown up yeah. siblings? Yeah. If we, you're talking politics. My brother and I, who's more conservative, we've learned we just don't even engage in that it's just yeah. it's not yeah has so been, oh sorry no has it been exacerbated like through the 2016 election and through the pandemic or was it even before that i think 2016 broke a lot of people yeah <laughs> i think it really did and um and i think there's a lot of reasons for that i don't think it's one person's fault or anything like that i think right. it was the convergence of and I, I, you know, this sounds controversial, but looking back, I think that needed to happen. I think um, things happen. We don't always know why, but I've noticed my tendency to look back and go, yeah, that kind of needed to happen. I think that needed to happen. You know, um, you don't have to enjoy it. Oh, yeah. But but uh it was well, sort I mean, of we were like talking a, about the viral moment before the show if you just want to put that red cap on right now that <laughs> might do it no 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 i'm i would say i'm i'm sympathetic i i am not um let's just say the last two election cycles i voted for someone no one heard of i was like a third party person yeah and even that i got a lot of flack for how dare you how dare <laughs> right. you not wrote, vote for the right person you know and by right the way person. Theoretically, I totally agree with you. I do think the wrench in the system had to be made, even if the results were what they were. I mean, to this point, the track that we were on, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It was a bit of a, yeah, it was going into a ditch. And I tend to think of um, what happens in the outside world as a reflection of what happens on the inside world. Right. So um, for a lot of people, can I swear on this for you? Absolutely. We're, oh. you know. Okay. No sponsors were good. Okay. So I was going to say it, it's, you know, a lot of people internally have a shit show going on. And mm. so that's just a reflection of the outward shit show. Yeah. So uh, a reflection of, you know, corruption. Yeah. You have corruption inside yourself. Um, 
globalists. Yeah, you got your own globalists trying to take over. Right. You know, unchecked power. Yep. In there. <laughs> you know, Hitler. Yep. It's all in there. Whatever you want to call it, whatever you're focused on and distressed by. Guess what? There's something inside you that probably needs to be processed around that. Right. Right. Or else it wouldn't bug you so much. Right. You know, it wouldn't be your cause, you know, of your life if it wasn't doing something inside you that yeah. probably needs to be healed on some level. Absolutely. So like even today, you know, I was on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, you know, it's not supposed to be controversial or anything. It's becoming a little more political, which is kind okay. of like, all right, whatever. Yeah. And someone put something up about working moms. And I said, I, I thought I thought I made a very little tiny comment. I just said, hey, you know, once people say working mom, because I work with moms, right? Professional moms. I said, when people say working moms, I think that's kind of like um, uh, repetitive because I think every mom works. And, you you know, and then extra when they take on another, the other burden of, or not burden, but the other experience of working outside the home. So I just made this little comment and I said, but I totally get what you're talking about. I just yeah. wanted to make that little note. And so this woman underneath me makes a comment and says, oh, every time we talk about this, someone needs to bring up that moms work too. And, and she just made this whole comment and she's like, we're talking about inequality in the workplace, you know? And I was like, she was irritated by what I said. Yeah. And I read it and I could feel my body reacting. I could feel like this, well, I want to say something to her, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And I could think of the sarcastic and I could think of the passive aggressive and I could think of the full on aggressive. And, and I finally said, I just hearted her. I just was like, love. And I was just like, oh, this is my opportunity to sit and have this feeling and get connected with the part of me that feels so misunderstood and so attacked and so like wow I, I just was walking in here making a comment and someone's like you're not allowed to do that and i'm like i don't want to have room and and i realized there's nothing for me to say to this person right because everything would be my ego's attempt to get her to like me and understand me and feel you know feel guilty for what she said and and i'm like that's all bs yeah I, all I got to do is process this emotion, not bypass it, not pretend it's all good, just feel it, allow it to come up because apparently it needed to come up. Right. Just like 2016 needed to happen. <laughs> you know, the blister needed to burst. And um, so I, I just thought, well, this is very um, appropriate right before this interview that this happened because now I just get to feel this. And and Dylan, this is huge progress because this used to, that kind of comment where someone's, you know, I feel misunderstanding me and irritated by me or whatever. They used to wipe me out for a day. Yeah. Like, oh my God, someone doesn't like me. What did I do wrong? And oh, sh who is she? And blah, blah, blah. And da, da, da. And, and I was just, oh, I shouldn't have said anything. Maybe I should take down what I said, you know, all of that stuff. And, and now it's just like, oh, I guess there's something to process. So I'm going to do that. And then it has nothing to do with this person. I don't even know this person. It's like this random stranger just decides, I don't like your comment. And I'm going to say something about it. And all right, cool. No, absolutely. And how do you think, this is kind of a, an interesting question too, because we have an, a, many different generations of women right now, um, many of whom are growing up on the internet and many whom have experienced the internet mm -hmm. much later in life. Yeah. So not even used to constantly the, you know, you got bullied in high school for sure. And there's something to be said about the physical um, bullying that happened, like you said, growing up in the 60s, 70s and 80s. But now with the constant, like, you know, anytime you want to get on screen, oh, look at this, look at that. And women oh. take get much differently than men. So how, how do you do you notice that when you're talking to different age groups of women and how they experience like um, harassment in the workplace or online and, and that sort of thing? Well, this was a woman saying this to me, so it wasn't even, you know. It wasn't like a guy going, "Hey, bitch," blah 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 blah. No, no, I just with um with 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 um so many women who don't experience, you know, with so many women who grew up talking face to face to people. So you actually have that emotional. Oh, impact. it's such a different. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I noticed. So yeah, I the technology like this is very new to me. In fact, I have to employ my children to help me half the time. <laughs> You know, how do I make this not blow up? Just press this, mom. And um, what I've noticed, what I noticed is 
when I was online, I would have one type of experience with people. And then maybe I would meet them in person, completely different experience. They were usually a lot nicer. Yeah. Um, because my perception of them was just on one subject in a point in time, very kind of one dimensional, I think. I don't know yeah. if it's the right amount of dimensions, but anyway. <laughs> and then I would meet them and they would be a whole person with, they'd have kids, they'd seem, they'd be smiling. We would kind of figure, oh, I know you from such and such online. And I go, wow, he was so much nicer than I thought he was. Because, right? Because it's just a, a lot of stuff is just like opinion, 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 opinion. And it's, yes. we never knew people's opinions as much as we knew, know them now. Right. I didn't know what my neighbors thought about politics. I didn't know what they ate for breakfast. I didn't need to know any of that. I just thought, oh, they were a nice person who, you know, you know, waters their lawn or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and has, you know, I could bar borrow a cup of sugar or I could, you know, bring my kids over in an emergency. And now I know who they're voting for and I don't agree. And, and oh my gosh, and they have all these causes and I don't, what, you know, and it, it really... Sometimes too much information is not good for us. Right. It's too confusing to the brain and it's too overstimulating. So I think you're right. I think the younger generation um, is suffering with that a little bit. And maybe, you know, you can tell me because you're obviously younger than me. If you've made adjustments in your diet of online activity over the years based on maybe too much or too little or it's a little toxic or yeah actually i'm a huge fan of comedy and there was a point a few years ago where i was watching a lot more political shows than i was comedy shows and i was just getting to a point where i would argue with people online and think say things yeah. i normally wouldn't say so now that i've gotten to mostly comedy podcasts and shows again it's a lot <laughs> less of that yeah. yeah i love comedy too so yeah. And, and and it comes into the comedy, obviously, for certain comedians. That's their political comedians. So, right. um, and it's it's the perfect tool, you know, whether it's political cartoons or what have you. It's you know the perfect tool to point out absurdity, and that's yes. all there is amongst you know. I mean, in the world in general, there's absurdity everywhere. But when you're trying to point out the differences between classes and what the perception is and what it could be and you know, the perfect illustrations are the, the comedians who can per portray these things through illustrations, yeah. through getting up on stage and saying, isn't this ridiculous? And then everyone goes, oh, yeah, yeah. that is ridiculous, you know, no yeah. matter red, yeah. white or blue. So they it pointing out the ridiculous in everything, really. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I do stand up on the side. And one of the things that I focus on is the ridiculousness of motherhood and yeah. raising young children and and. I was doing it literally just for myself. It was sort of like a bucket list item. Like I want to do stand up and I want to talk about this and this, you yeah. know, that was the subject in my face. So that's what I talked about. And then after the show I did, this woman came up to me and she said, I have three kids too. I never get out. I'm so glad I came. I laughed so hard. I almost peed my pants. <laughs> and I went, you're welcome. You know, bring some, shields next time i don't know um but i thought oh this is serving other people it's helping yeah. this lady just like have a cathartic laugh just like i had that cathartic cry you know right um well, this yeah. is fantastic because you bringing that up that that is coming back to me now i remember in a conversation it was either a conversation you were having or something you had written down somewhere that you were doing stand up as well and i thought oh this is fantastic because recently i think it was 2020 i finally had had the nerve to go to an open mic and I've been going to a few, you know, since then. So right. I'm, I'm very fascinated to know now. I mean, how did you start? How did it go? All those sorts of things. Okay. So, um, I would think it was 2017, 2018. I saw a course at our adult school for, um, standup comedy and I had done comedy ske sketch comedy okay. in, um, you know, I was in shows in high school and then in, college i was part of a comedy troupe called the crusaders <laughs> um it was a catholic school they were the crusaders and so we we're the crusaders um so i did that and then um in um a catholic school comedy group huh yeah well we made a lot of priest and nun jokes and yeah all that mm -hmm. stuff 
Um, I love some reels if you could send them my way after the show. Oh, I got to dig them up from the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> we were just interviewed by our alumni magazine and we got it caught together and we we're like, oh my God, you're so old. Oh, I'm old too. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was fun talking about it. And um, so we I did that. And then in um, graduate school, um, I was in New York City. So I was doing social work during the day and I was doing improv and sketch comedy at night and music. So I was just like, I'm going to do it all, you know? Yeah. So, and then even I did, um, at, uh, I went to Columbia and at Columbia, each school had a show at the end of the year. And I was like, social work doesn't have a show. We got to have a show. So my friend and I made a show and we did parodies of, of like musicals, you know, about social work. And we had like a, a beat poetry part and we brought our professors in to be in it. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun and we started it. So that was my legacy to Columbia social work school. But anyway, <laughs> so I did some sketch shows after I graduated in the city. So that was an amazing experience. Although I realized how dysfunctional people are <laughs> so dysfunctional, the people who were doing this with me and I was dysfunctional too. I just didn't know it. I just was oh, yeah. going, you're just the, the dark humor that people really have when you're just the two of you, you know? Oh yeah. And you know, <laughs> you're trying to be creative, right? So yeah. anything goes, but we had a successful sold out show in the village and I was like, we did something. <laughs> um, so I did that. And then many years. So then I just kind of put it all aside, had kids. And so this, this thing came up at the adult school and I was just like, literally was shaking registering. I was like, hmm, but I registered for it. And then I realized I showed up and it's at the middle school. I mean, literally <laughs> we walked down, I walk, it wasn't an HBO special. It was, I was walking down the hall of the middle school and like there are people playing basketball and we were in the health, um, the health classroom. So there were like vaginas all over the world. <laughs> Perfect. I was like, this is the best place to do comedy. You got reproductive <laughs> organs everywhere. So, and it was just people who, it was also on their bucket list or they had been told they were really funny. And yeah. we, so it was kind of a motley crew of, you know, just normal people. And the, the graduation of the show was the show. Okay. So it was of the course. Nice. So, um, so we did that and it was so magical. I mean, it was the guy who was teaching it was a working comedian who worked with a lot of comedians and he was really good at giving feedback. And, and um, I realized that, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I'm like, okay, I'm not the worst. I'm not the worst. And which is nice thing about open mics because right. you're probably not the worst person there. <laughs> yeah, probably. Right. Um, as long as all the neurons are firing and you're not too drunk, you definitely won't be the worst. You won't. Right. <laughs> so, um, so I did this show and it was like between you, me and the lamppost, it was as exciting as my wedding day. I have to say I was so once I got up there and the panic, there was a huge panic right before where your mind goes blank. You know, that performance like, why am I going up there? Yeah. What what am I talking about? <laughs> and then you're like, well, I guess I'm going. And then you get up there and you say your first couple words and then people laugh. And then you're like, oh, I know what I'm doing. And then you just do the rest of it. And yeah. maybe even by the end, you might be having a good time. But there's something very surreal of being on stage with the lights and the people and you hear the laughter and, and people are with you, except when they're not. That's not a great feeling. But when they're with you, there's something amazing about that. And um, and so I just got the fever after that. I was just like, when do I get to do this again? And so I started doing open mics and I found a couple of, you know, in the New Jersey circuit of amateur comedians where they do shows where it's easy to get in um, and you meet other people. And then if they like you, they're going to invite you to their thing. So it's, it's and then you find out online, of course, there's open mic pages on Facebook that you can sign up for. Oh, yeah. um, and if you're on time and polite and you have a pretty good set, you're doing better than most people. So you stand out a little bit. Absolutely. And people, you know, they're like, Oh, you showed up. You weren't completely high off your ass. <laughs> you want to be in my show, you know? Yeah. Um, and 
So it was just, um, it was something I did instead of what I do now. Like it was sort of like, I need a break from coaching. I'm just burnt out. And so that right. was my alternative that I moved to. And I was really glad that I did it. And, um, and then I started producing shows with my t old teacher and a girlfriend who was in the class with me. Okay. And the three of us produced three different shows in our town. It was, it was a great setup. We split the producing um, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So someone got the headliner. I was in charge of recruiting local comedians right. and having them rehearse with me because they were also amateurs. So I was like, come and we're going to have a couple of rehearsals so you can go through your material and we give them feedback. And then um, someone else was in charge of the venue and the booze. And, uh, and we would literally, it was $25 a ticket and you could kind of drink whatever you wanted. We couldn't sell alcohol. So we're just like, we'll give you some drink tickets, but really <laughs> I was looking. And um, so people would come for a night out. It's like a Friday night, great date. You, you go to dinner and you go to the show and you have a couple of glasses of wine or a beer and all of the humor, most of it was about people in the town or the town itself. So we tried to put a lot of like little local weird things that happen in our town. And then you would have a professional headliner who would do a 30 minute set. So even if we all sucked <laughs> for 25 bucks, you got to see a professional com working comedian yeah, do their thing. Do and every show was sold out every single show. Wow. And people didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. They'd hang out in the back. We're like, guys, you got the keg is empty, man. You got to go. You must and, have thought about doing more after. Yeah. I just thought, who says you can't make money with comedy it's if you produce the comedy? And that was the other thing is because we were producing, we could just say, well, I'm going to do a 10 minutes or right. I'm going to be the MC. So right. I got to do my set. No pressure. <laughs> I got to do it. And I had all these other people involved and, and I made sure everyone got paid. That was the other one. I was like, everyone got, has to get a little something, even the amateurs, 20 bucks. They'll feel so good. It felt so good to get paid, you know, when you, when you do your five minutes, your 10 minutes and um, yeah. And they bring their friends because it's like, Oh my God, aunt Jane's going on stage and I'm going to tell jokes. We got to go. We got to see this shit show. Let's see what happens. And just everyone will have such a great time. It was a party. That's, I think the biggest takeaway for me around comedy was what helped me be le a little less nervous was this is just a party that we're inviting people to. They're going to sit, they're going to eat, they're going to drink, and they're just going to be entertained. And yeah. I can do that. That's my life. That was, <laughs> that was a steady thread throughout my life was, absolutely. you know, I was the little kid who was the kooky dance girl or, or, oh, she's cute. She's the baby. Or look at her do this. I'm like, yeah, I could do that with my eyes closed. So, so I started to feel that. And it was such a great community experience. People laughing with you. Right. And every once in a while, they'll give the, oh, the moan. You know, that's great. I think one of my comedy friends would say, a moan is as good as, as a laugh for me. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it kind of is. Um, and, and then the other thing that's interesting about that is because it was in our town, like the next day I would go downtown and people are like, Hey, I saw you last night. And you're like, Whoa, okay. You know, it was, it was weird to be yeah. recognized, you know, hey, you're famous. Yeah. Famous in yeah. My own town. So, so it was a lot of fun. And our last show was March 6, 2020. And then everything shut down. Of course. So we kind of squeaked by, which is right under. <laughs> and then um, and then everything closed down. And I did one virtual show like two weeks after that because we were kind of like, well, let's try to do something else. Yeah. And and then um, and then just everything without an audience, which is not easy. Yeah. If you watched any of the late night people when they were trying to do their monologues with no audience, it was just like Meow. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I did that and then it's one of the things in your bio that if you put comedian, people immediately want to know about that because that's novel. Yeah. And so it just kept coming up. When are you going to do that again? My, 
the receptionist at the orthodontist is like, so are you to do any more shows? And I'm like, oh my God, really? So then I had this opportunity where I literally was at Trader Joe's, ran into one of the guys from the original class who was now teaching the class. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, how's the class going? You know, and he's like, it's going all right. He's like, you want to do 10? And I'm like, what? What? He's like, yeah, five, seven, whatever you want to do. <laughs> we need people. All right. And I was like, all right. and I first I was like, let me get back to you. And then I was like, why not? I have dozens of pages of material. Just <laughs> pluck out a couple of those, memorize them, and you're good. And so got back in the game and just did a show, that show, um, last week, maybe. Oh, hey, awesome. Yeah. How do you feel? It felt great. Yes. It felt great. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, I am not a skier. My husband's a huge skier. Okay. So I have taken about 20 beginner lessons of skiing. Yeah. Never get beyond beginner. But I tell you, the last 10 times, it's like, you're the best beginner in that class. <laughs> it's a great position to be in because you're just like, you're getting your skis on. They're like, how do you do that? I'm like, I just click in. You know? <laughs> but they don't know that you've done this 20 times. So they're like, oh, you're so, you're a natural athlete. I'm like, yeah, not really. I'm just taking the same lesson 20 times. God's gift so, of skiing, really. Exactly. I'm like, we're going on the lift. I know how to do that. And um, so it felt like that because everyone, it was their first show except for the headliner. And so I was someone who had some experience. And so they were like, I'm so nervous. I'm like, it's totally normal. It's okay. I jump up and down sometimes. I get the energy out. It's you need the energy to get up there and be alert. And that's part of the performance. Like I got to be like a nice little support for them. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's, Sometimes nice to be the best in the beginner class, you know? Yeah. Although maybe it's time to bump up maybe to be the next level. But it was it was an easy show and I recognized a lot of faces, which is also nice. And just sort of being in person with people. It was the first time I had done that since um the whole shutdown and everything. And I was like, wow, I can see people's faces. <laughs> you know? This is nice. And, um, and that was sort of, I didn't want to go back into the clubs until we could do that. I just, yeah. I went to a comedy show with my husband and everyone had to be masked. And I was like, this is so weird to be laughing through your mask. So just didn't feel right. I mean, I was happy to be there. Yeah. And people had their little, that was the other thing. It's, it was at our local performing arts center and they sell wine and beer in these hip, sit, literal Sippy cups. They look like sippy cups, but you're drinking beer or wine. So it's kind of like adult toddlers, you know. <laughs> and um, and so everyone was like, and I'm like, so ridiculous. Yeah. So so anyway, I was just like, I really don't want to I don't want to be doing comedy with a bunch of people with masks on unless I'm like, you know, from doing comedy on an oncology unit. God bless. But in the regular world i just didn't want to do that so it was really good to see i think there was one person who had a mask on um but everyone else was unmasked and it was so good and just to hear the laughter and the clapping and um and then i love the after part of the show where yeah. people are were kind of debriefing and meeting people and um or re getting reacquainted with people who maybe like i ran into someone i went to college with who just decided to come yeah. to my show and i was like hi how are you all after 30 <laughs> years how's it going and um and then you know all of the they want to talk about comedy afterwards like all the comedians were like hey did you see that bill burr and yeah yeah did you see the did you see the um norm mcdonald yeah i saw that man that was cool and, and some of them really want to break it down too. Like, did you see the way I wrapped it here and I put the thing? Up yes, there? yes, yes. Yeah. Well, this joke is about this and this, and I and then I had a callback to this. Did you notice that? Yeah, they very analytical. I'm yeah. just sitting there like all I saw you do was hump a stool, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was funny. <laughs> so it that sounds like your husband has seen you perform live. He has been the butt of my jokes. So oh, perfect. poor, poor guy. I was just like, do you want to know how you're the butt? Come to the show. If you don't want to know, you don't need to know. 
No, he's good. Sometimes he films me if there's a if um, there's a place where they don't do filming, and um, sometimes he has retort retorted my um, my claims about him, which made it actually even funnier because they don't know my husband's in the audience. So I'm like joke, 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 and all of a sudden you hear something come out, and I'm like, oh, honey, come on, you know. And everyone's like, ah, you know, controversy. And um, he's super supportive. Um, he loves comedy too. He we love. We don't, he likes to go to concerts, but we like to go see comedians. Okay. So we have our faves that we watch and, um, you don't like a good concert, you know, I think it's too long for me. Gotcha. It's like, oh I've my heard God. even comedians say, I, even comedians I've heard say, I couldn't go to someone else's comedy show. It's just, you're locked in for too long. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been to some, I like seeing, you know, the, the professionals do it because I feel like, you know, someday, maybe ever, I'll might be close to that. Um, I think I learn a lot. You learn a lot because they're so at ease. At True. least they, it's like my mom, the Olympian. She looked like it was no big deal. And yeah. I think that's helpful. Um, and then I, I did watch the Norm McDonald special. I don't know if you saw that. I don't know if you. Is that the one where he's just by himself? Uh, in the, I haven't yeah. seen all, no, I haven't seen all of it yet. But I will say, um, that was a huge difference for me getting up on stage. Was I'd seen Norm Macdonald in movies before I'd gone on stage, but I really started watching his shows he did, like his podcast and some of his stand up. Once I started doing stand up, and that really helped me take comfort in the science yes. and yes, and bombing up there. You know, like this is yeah. funny too. This is fine. I can work with this too. Yeah. Yes, that's the comfort, exactly how I felt. It's there's something because he's like, well, you know, the those people, and then and it takes him, he meanders towards his subject, and yeah. he's just so comfortable with the whole thing, and he doesn't care if it gets a laugh. If it's funny no. to him, he's gonna do it. And it's really about I feel like owning your material and being okay and not worrying about what's gonna happen. And uh, yeah, I watched it and, and, you know, doing that, he just was kind of, I'm sure he had prepared material. Right. Um, but the way he delivered it in the, cause he went on for like 40 minutes, I think, um, with no audience just into the camera. And I was just like, I don't know. It calmed me down. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It calmed me down. And, um, and you're waiting I, for the punchline and even Half the time, the punchline is worse than the setup. It's totally flat. Yes. And then you're yes. like, I can't, the fact that he just wasted five minutes of my yes. time is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Like he doesn't care. He, yeah, exactly. And, and, or the punchline will come like 20 minutes later. Yeah. He'll sneak it in there. It's almost <laughs> like he forgot there was a punchline and he's like, oh yeah, and by the way, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, ah, you know, um, I feel that way about Andy Kaufman too. Um, mm. Uh, I love Bill Burr because he's not afraid to be controversial. Um, uh, and I don't always agree with him, but it's, right. then I also realize he's a comedian. So it's like, <laughs> what are you agreeing with? A joke? Right. Yeah. You know, some guy. <laughs> he's not really beating his wife, you know, right. it's like, <laughs> um, but he reminds me of my brothers in mm. that kind of like more traditional male I think that's, I feel a a connection with him that way. Yeah. He just thinks it and says it. Yeah. And he's like, what, what are you going to do? Ah! <laughs> you know, <laughs> come on. Um, so I like that. I, there's so many comedians. I mean, I love watching Jerry Seinfeld. I feel like he's another one that gives great comfort to me because he's just whatever the spoon I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the spoon for a half an hour and why do they make it this way? And just the curiosity um, although he's much more neurotic, he's much more of a neuroses, you know, he's got his things. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and other things he doesn't care about, like people, he's like, nah, I don't care about people. <laughs> um, so, and then I watched the George Carlin, we watched the George Carlin special and I was just like, he's at a, I feel like he was at a level of speed and very intellectual that I was just like, if I thought that was the only way to do comedy, I don't think I would ever attempt it. Right. He's so, 
so, such the wordsmith and so fast and ran, just like rattling off things all the time. And you're like, how I have a hard time memorizing my 10 minutes, you know, and he's got it. His is so precise that the wording is really important. It's mm -hmm. like, you can't miss that. So he puts it on a completely different level. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, comedy is just. Well, and, wa and, and watching that special too, you know, with my daughter coming on a year now, I, it just really hits home how I don't like celebrity worship by any means. I do admire a lot of celebrities for the performances they give, but it really hits home how, yeah, they have to raise families too and yeah. go on the road and be funny and be this person that everyone else expects them to be and then be a dad to their daughter when they're yeah. known to be this dirty guy to everyone else and. Uh, it's just, or you know, with women too. I, whether it's Roseanne or whoever you want to throw out there, so it is, it is fascinating. Um, but sh making the shift back to you, yeah, uh, and the, the self compassion project and dealing with moms yeah. and everyone. Uh, you said you worked in. Do you still work with? In, are you still in social work? So I'm not. A, I'm not licensed in the state of New Jersey. I have okay. a master's in social work, and I use the skills that I learned in social work school for sure. Um, but I would just call myself a coach. Um, okay. although I'm, I don't have a coaching certificate either. I just sort of took what I learned from my coach, took what I learned from social work school and, and I use all of it. And then I use everything else I learned. You know, I've read so many books and I've followed so many teachers and I take little elements from all of them and, um, throw them in there. You know, it's sort of like, oh, let's do a little Byron Katie and we'll do a little Deepak Chopra. And now we're going to do a little Wayne Dyer and then we're going to do a little Robert, you know, whatever, whatever's needed in the moment. Yeah. Well, I was just curious if it, the people you encounter, the, the women who seek out, you know, your guidance and counsel, if they tend to be more often from that field because you are dealing, you know, you have a family, but also social work isn't just, I'm not trying to downplay other works that women may do, but it's not just mindless, punching the clock and you're dealing with other people as well, you know, whether they have mental disabilities or they're elderly and yeah. they need that type. So it's your own family that needs a lot of special needs and other people that also have their own special needs. So do you find that your clientele is more social work or is it just so varied? My, you mean like the clients are, have a social work background or did you mean? Yeah. Like, do they normally have a social work background and the people in the groups that you're in or no, like, I would say the common thread for my clients are obviously their moms and they usually are either working or trying to build a career. So they're juggling a lot of balls. Um, yeah. That was what I really felt like in my own life, but they're kind of earlier versions of me, you know, <laughs> when yeah. I was having difficulty and struggling with all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, but they, most of them have, a spiritual core to them that either they haven't tapped into or they've tapped into, but they're stuck. They're right. stuck at like a level of, well, I believe this and I believe that, but it's not going well. What, what am I missing here? Right. Um, so we definitely get into more of like the energy of things and, and, and their connection with something bigger usually comes up, not religiously, but just more of like, um, you know, what's your worldview? Do you feel like we're just randomly here and there's no meaning or connection and we're alone? Or do you feel like you, there's a larger energy maybe working with us or orchestrating this or you're tapped into? And usually most of the clients that I work with are like, oh yeah, I'm totally, I read your website and I'm totally down with what you're doing. So we're like, okay, let's go in and check it all out. And I've also worked with people who are very religious. Okay. And you can get in there and do all sorts of things. You know, I worked with Orthodox Jews, for instance. So they're not necessarily into Buddhism right. or meditation, but they know what it's like to have faith in God. Yeah. For sure. That's their that's their thing. And so a lot of times it's connecting with, you know, well, what would the Torah say about that? You know? I just bring it to them and they go, oh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, so what's the problem with that? You know? And <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, actually I feel like they're very fun to work with because I don't know much about, I know a little bit cause I live on the East upper East coast, yeah. but, but I'm not, 
Jewish and I didn't grow up in that tradition. So, and certainly not Orthodox. So there's a lot of things I don't know. So I learn a lot of things too, but um, they're actually great to work with because they're already kind of hooked in. I don't have to convince them that there's this energy out there. They're already like, oh yeah, yeah, got it. So, um, so I would say that's the common theme. There's some spirituality going on there. Um, but there are women who are trying to raise a family, trying to grow a career or trying to work their job or, or do something just otherwise, other than being a mom, because for their own sake, and they're just at a loss of how to do all this stuff. And they feel like they're trying to control everything. They're trying to please everyone. It's not working out any way. And they just feel like exhausted. And, um, so I come in and go, okay, have a cup of tea with me. Let's figure it out. Is, is neglectful partners often a thing or not even? Sometimes there's uh, people are separated or divorced or on the verge of that. Sometimes it's the perception of the husband uh, or partner being neglectful or doesn't understand them. Um, and then as we go on, we realize that that's just a perception. Yeah. And it's like, you know, when someone's, feeling hurt and they act angry and then you're trying to comfort them, but you're like, it's like trying to hug a porcupine. So you kind of just kind of leave them and then they interpret that as abandonment. That's a lot of what happens right. is I'm so hurt that I'm really angry. And now you're not doing, you're not giving me a hug, you jerk. And you're like, yeah, I don't really want to hug you right now, honey. You know, that's sort of the pattern a lot of times. And then they realize actually my husband does love me. He's just confused or, doesn't know how to do what I want him to do because I'm not even telling him I'm thinking he's supposed to know. And because he doesn't know, it doesn't means he doesn't love me, you know, right. like that kind of thing. So a lot of marriages are actually, sometimes it means a separation and sometimes it means the marriage improves a lot because they stop being so bitter. <laughs> and they can have that more relaxed dialogue. Yeah. 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 Um, do you find that, do you encounter a lot of women whose faith has been shaken? I would say, yeah, if you use the word faith in a more broad sense and not just like a religious faith, okay, but more like faith in themselves, faith in, um, what they're, what was supposed to happen to them in their life because they did all the right things. Yeah. So they followed all the rules and they were a very good girl and they worked hard and they're miserable. And so I would say they don't understand um, why they are where they are. They just, and then they, usually they come to the conclusion it's because I'm not good enough or I'm not lovable enough. And then that's where we dive in and go, okay, let's look at that. And that's an interesting one too, because I've been meaning to bring this up as well. I don't know if you, would you call yourself a therapist or a counselor? Um, I don't call myself a therapist, although I do things that are very therapeutic. Okay. So, um, and I prefer coach. Okay. Or I, sometimes I've called myself an emotional doula. I don't know if you know what a doula is. I've heard it, but I've never had it really explained, okay. I guess. So a doula is the professional who has taken the place of the aunt, the grandmother, um, who used to be with women when they gave birth. Okay. So it's kind of like, I don't know how old doulas as a profession is, but it used to be when a woman gave birth, there was always other women who were experienced at that with her to give her some relief. It could like be- Like a midwife or not even? Well, a midwife is actually the person who helps the birthing process, like okay. actually is there like that. And, um, <laughs> but the doula is- I think it's Greek for being with women. And it's really, that's the, the doula is the one who's like, um, let's bring the birthing ball. Let's, let's put pressure on your lower back. Let's get you into a shower. Okay. Let's uh, take, take a bath. Oh, okay. Let's try this position. Um, she's a, certainly a midwife can do all those things, but the midwife's not with you at home. Right. The doula comes to your home. Um, and then it, like all of, I've had three births, obviously, and because the first one was a cesarean, I, I had to do the other two in a hospital. That's New Jersey law. Hmm. But I had a midwife and a doula. 
And so I was able to do a, um, an unmedicated natural birth those second two times. And I uh -huh. think I wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise because there would have been too many restrictions. So, um, so anyway, the doula came to my home. We walked around the neighborhood for hours. Um, she actually drove me to the hospital. My husband followed us with, you know, me meals and equipment and all that stuff. <laughs> but she was the one to say, I don't think you're ready yet or let's get you into a bathtub or um, time to go on your side or, oh, I can tell it's time to go to the hospital. And I'm like, how do you know? She's like, cause you're crying. And I was like, are you telling me I could have cried an hour ago? And got <laughs> but so she's the one who's just making sure you have a birthing plan, making sure you have help, making sure that your husband's gonna like help you afterwards just all of those things you don't even think about hmm. so she was so anyway and what i call emotional doula is is someone like me who is you're having your emotion you're in labor with your emotion and you call me and i go okay it's time to do this now it's time to do that i'm like the calming person whispering in your ear this is totally normal you're going to survive this it's time to let that feeling come up. So I'm kind of walking through the processing and emotion and the metaphor is you're, you're kind of birthing and it's kind of coming out of you. Sounds you know? like a husband's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> you get to take all that pressure off of us. Uh, well, I tell you, you know, my husband was so funny because he's like, I don't think the doula likes me. And I'm like, <laughs> why? And he's like, she keeps saying, go stand over there and get sandwiches. I ordered Coke. She got diet. Right. Exactly. I said, and um, I said, I think she likes you. It's just that you don't know what to do with yourself. And you, when men see their women in distress, they freak out, right? Yeah. It's like okay. not fun to watch someone in pain. So the duel is there to go, dad, it's okay. It's normal. She helps you go get sandwiches. She kept him busy, you know, Cause he's like befuddled. What do I do now? I'm here, but I can't, I'm supposed to be doing something. I don't know what to do. And right. my wife is like, you know, whatever, screaming, moaning, <laughs> um, cursing at me and, um, blaming me, blaming me. Yeah. I did the first time around. I have to say <laughs> it was, you know, hour, whatever, 12, 13. And I just said to my husband and I felt so bad saying this in the moment, I was just like, honey, I think maybe this is our last baby. Do you think we just have one? And he's like, yeah, whatever you want. I'm like, really? You really mean it? Cause I just don't think I can do this anymore. And he's like, yeah, it's fine. And, um, and then of course, you know, a couple hours later, I was just like, I'm, I didn't mean it. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, really? He's like, Rita, you're in labor. You're saying all sorts of shit. You know, <laughs> but I felt so terrible about saying that. And of course. Yeah. And that's, that's not, that's nothing. That's no. Nothing and people are like, say. you were being very nice about that. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. I would have killed for that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I feel bad now. I mean, my wife's pregnant again and it's so soon after. Yeah. Irish twins. We used to call that. I'm just Can like, I, say oh, that? No, Irish twins? I, I wish you had a break. <laughs> yeah. Is she breastfeeding? Uh, not she? with our, not with our daughter now. No, but she was okay. in the, in the yeah. beginning. Well, that is a natural contraception is the breastfeeding. Oh. But once you stop, your hormones change. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not like you can't get pregnant when you're breastfeeding, but breastfeeding is a natural um, family planner. Well, maybe this formula shortage is a good thing. Yeah. Get her back on the boob. No. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a good transition. Yeah. Um, also, one thing that's kind of interesting, the reason I even asked if you'd consider yourself a therapist is for me, um, I took psychology. I did some social work cl um, classes at my um, community college. And there's just this feeling, the same thing when I think about becoming a cop, I'm like, I can never become a cop because I break the law. So there was always this feeling of, well, I can never become a therapist because I have my own problems. So oh. did you ever think that? And how did you overcome that? Uh, well, uh, here's newsflash. Newsflash, a lot of crazy therapists out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. People it's become and psychiatrists. Right? It's yeah. yeah, it's I think we teach what we need to learn. So my um it's, yeah, I like that. 
Yeah. I mean, that's why I wrote the self-compassion book because I was the worst at self-compassion. You know, it was just, <laughs> I got better, but I needed to write a book about it in order to get better. So, and do the courses. Um, I think one of the things that um, I, one of the reasons I love coaching people is just the pleasure of coaching them, but also because it keeps me honest. It keeps me humble because I realize that I'm not perfect. I, I, you know, I just told you about like I was having this like, you know, reaction to this woman on LinkedIn, you know? So, um, but I think clients find that a relief because I've had people say, oh, well, it's easy for you to say because you're so good at this and you're so that I'm like, I am not special at all. I got my own shit all the time. It's yeah. coming up. This is the difference. I use my strategies. I'm committed to them. Right. And I've changed my relationship to life. In other words, it's not about me being perfect. It's about me having a more congenial relationship to whatever is happening. It's so it's not what happens in your life. It's right. what your relationship to it is. Okay. And once I figured, and then that's not even original. That's a Robert Scheinfeld. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's the thing. way. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm sure a lot of other teachers have talked about this too, but so as a coach, I figured out all I had to do was be a page ahead of whoever I'm working with. And sometimes a paragraph ahead, you know? Um, and, and a lot of times clients surpass things that uh, I've done, you know, like I have clients who make way more money than me, way more, like astonishingly more. Yeah. And, uh, but they're not focused on that. They're focused on this other thing, you know, that's giving them a hard time. Um, so, so it's not, I think we're all here to help each other get home, you know? We're all just walking each other home, as I think Ram Das said that, right? We're just like, so what I'm good at is I'm really good at coaching. I'm really good at figuring out what what's really going on here, being a detective, and then showing you how to look at that in a different way or have a different relationship to it and use it for your own growth. So I can do that with anyone, anytime, anywhere, as long as they're willing to do that. And so right. I don't have to have all my problems figured out. In fact, I think that's what stops a lot of people from doing a lot of things, right? Absolutely. Um, stop me from doing comedy a lot. Oh, well, she doesn't have three kids. So that's why she can go to the open mic or she can mm -hmm. do that. Well, she, and then you find someone who actually does have three kids and you're like, fuck, shit, <laughs> I can't blame my kids anymore. Yeah, new excuse. Yeah. So... I think, you know, once I remember working with a, a coaching client and she had that kind of like, oh, well, you've got it all together perception. And I was like, um, no, mm -mm. let me tell you what irritated me this morning. And as soon as she I thought at first, oh, I'm going to lose her or she's going to think, oh, I don't want to work with her. And she's like, oh, my God, I feel so much relief. Oh, my God, you're not perfect. I'm like far from it. But I just don't. <laughs> hate myself for being imperfect. I right. just like kind of think I'm adorable for, for not being perfect. Cause you know, trees aren't perfect and they're amazing. So. Well, and you add the layers of, I need to be a perfect mom for my child. Then, you know, that's way deeper. Yeah. And that's a harder one to shake because you've got a child who's you're biologically usually connected to, you know, you have a connection with them. Yeah. And it's biological meaning as a mother, you feel biological urge to protect and make yes. sure. And I came to the conclusion, you do your best and you can only do as good as you're conscious of. You can't go be of, you can't go beyond what you're conscious of. You know right. what I mean? Like yeah. you just, it's like the menu is just limited by what you're conscious of. So like the Sam Harris thing. Yeah. And, and then when you become a little more conscious, then you saw, you see other things on the menu. You're like, I didn't even know that was an option. So um, I realized my kids aren't, I don't want my kids to be perfect. I want them to have the life they're supposed to have. A lot of that has nothing to do with me. You know, they came in with their blueprint. This is what they're supposed to do. Sometimes I'm just an observer. Just wait till your kids start driving and you'll realize that. And um, I'm already afraid of her just walking. <laughs> yeah, I know. You go, well, that's why it's, you do it over time or else you pass out from the panic, 
you know, it's just little, little bits of letting go little one finger at a time. <laughs> and, um, and you, you go all right to the best, like, you know, you do the best you can. That's all you can do. And then there's give yourself a lot of room for apologies. You know, like, I'm so sorry I yelled at you. It had nothing to do with you. Or I'm so sorry that I didn't show up there. I just couldn't, or I should have, but I didn't. And I'm sorry. I mean, I think a good apology really goes a long way yeah. with anyone. And I know I didn't get a lot of apologies when I was a kid. But when I did, I was like, wow, mom's apologizing. That's big. And you can feel it in your body. She's recognizing. Because that's yeah. all kids want anyway. They want to be recognized and seen. That's all they want. That's all they want. Absolutely. Do you, you know, if you if you listen to the news, if you fall for social media, you would think that everyone's just a sensitive snowflake now, which I think when you actually talk to people, people are a little harder than you would perceive, but yes, when you meet clients for the first time or even the first few sessions, I don't know if you call them sessions or the first few times you talk to them, is it hard to be completely honest with them or do you just not deal with people you think you can't be honest with? Um, that's a really good question. So I usually do what I, what they call a con discovery call. So it's like a 20, 30 minute call where I'm just kind of figuring out what their, the issues are that they're presenting. And then we go yes or no, or here's another person. And um, I kind of, I asked them questions like, you know, are you willing to be completely honest with me about what's going on? Because if you're not, I can't help you. Yeah. And usually they're like, yes, I can do that. And I'm like, okay, can you follow directions? Because you need to be coachable. You need to like, yes, I can. You know, usually they're so desperate, but like, whatever, where, where do I send the Venmo payment? <laughs> you know? Um, and I'm like, before I take your money, which I will gladly take, I need to know if this is going to work. So, and I go, do you mind an occasional swear word? They're like, yeah, I don't care. And I'm like, okay, good. Cause I was, you know, otherwise you're shit out of luck, you know? Um, so we get a, a sense for, can they take me and can I take them? You know, if this is going to work. And I haven't had a lot of problems with that at all, really, to tell you the truth. Um, and I think it also helps that I get a lot of referrals from former clients. So they say, this is Rita. This is what she does. She's really cool. I don't know what exactly they say, but they have an un a little bit of an idea of what I'm about before they even knock on my door. Good. The culmination of the book, was that something you were just relieved to be done with? Or did it feel like an actual... No, I worked for this. This happened on time and this is exactly what it needed to be. Well, I think any project, I would say the 99.9% .9 of projects that I do do not turn out the way exactly that I think they're supposed to. Like a lot of my preferences are not met and I've learned to like let go of preferences. Like it's great if it happens, but I know it's going to be fine. Yeah. Um, so I'll show you the book here. Please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's usually on my back wall here. Ooh. Can you see it? This is the book. Beautiful. The self compassion gorgeous, project right? for anyone just yep. listening later on. Yeah. Yep. And um, on Amazon and uh, becomingawake.com, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So someone designed this cover and I was not familiar. Like I was doing a lot of Fiverr stuff. So this was like realsies, you know, not cheap. And I was. And I was like, oh, this is an investment. You know, like when you're doing these projects, you're investing money and time before anything comes back to you. Absolutely. There's a lot of unfront, in front investment. And now every time I look at this book and people go, wow, what a beautiful cover. I'm like, yeah, it was a great investment. You know what I mean? Like you just never know how it's going to turn out. And um, I'm like this, the cover sells the book. So I, that was a huge lesson for me. It's like good to invest money in really good cover work. Um, so that was a surprise. And then of course I got a lot of editing readers gave me feedback and that's the toughest part I think for me, because it can hit that. Am I doing a good enough job? Does this make sense? You're testing out your recipes kind of with people and they're like, mine came out like gobbledygook. What's it supposed <laughs> to look like? So does this really work? And the biggest, um, feedback I got was cause these are people that knew me and they're like, this book is great, but you're funny. You need to make it funnier because that's who you are. And so I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that. I so that. my editor and I, 
who's also has a comedy background, we just went on a joke a thon and we just boo, 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 boo. and it really made the book so much better. So I had no idea because when you're going from a course, which you're doing like this yeah. to a book, you're like, what else am I missing that I say that I don't even think about saying? It's a different way of communicating. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what I hate about finishing up with these podcasts. Is as soon as we're done, I'm like, I didn't even ask this. Ah, <laughs> So frustrating. Uh, do you have another book in the works? Are you thinking of writing something else? So um, I took this, I'm taking this year long marketing course. And part of it is writing a book, which I didn't even sign up for that. Like I didn't care because I was like, I got a book, but I'm like, all right, so I'll do it. And this one um, is a very different process. It was four days. You, you get your first draft in four days, the whole first draft. Oh, wow. So it's all right brain writing right just get it for down. like hours and hours and hours over four days but with a lot of breaks and what came out of me because they're like don't even think about what you're going to write just start writing so i had no idea what i was going to write about and it looks like what i'm writing about is energy it's writing a, it's it's going to be called something to the effect of up leveling your energy or up leveling your life something like that and it's a story of how I went from one level of energy to a different level of energy. And I name them and stuff like that for my own, just for, so people, you know, understand what I'm talking about. But yeah. I feel like I wrote it from a place of real miracle energy. Like, not like miracles are happening all the time, but like, this is a miracle what we're doing right now. Like that's the feeling I have a lot when I'm in that energy yeah. field is, Wow, this desk is a miracle. That tree is a miracle. You're a miracle. Oh my God, <laughs> boiling water, that's a miracle. And it's a great place to be. It's a great place to live. And sometimes it dips down. But the book is about how do you get into those levels? What do you do? What's the process? And and not to worry if you go out of them because you know what the process is. So it's and it's using my story of my life to illustrate those different levels and then how I got there. Yeah, that's a good one because uh, do you plan on doing anything with like um, chemical addiction because that influences energy quite a bit. I don't know if <laughs> that was something you dabbled with or even bothered to touch on in this particular book. Maybe to save that for another one. Well, I could touch on that. That's a great thing because I'm only in my second draft, so you know this could be completely different by the end. But yeah. Um, I think addiction in general, not just chemical addiction, but addiction, um, we're all addicted to something. Right. Um, I've had my own addictions for sure. Um, nothing majorly debilitating, but, you know, caffeine, um, YouTube. Uh, um, what else was I addicted to? I had a nicotine habit for a while earlier in my life. Okay. So, um, and it's the same process. It's just that I think because there's more of an impact on society when you have a drug addiction, you know, it's just more in your face, you know, yeah. like if I have a YouTube addiction, it's not going to affect my driving necessarily. But, you know, obviously if you have an alcohol or drug addiction, it's going to affect your driving. Right. Um, but I think we're all in a very addictive place, most of us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that definitely needs to be new because it keeps you, it keeps you locked in, right? right? It doesn't allow you to see other options. Uh, it, it, um, it limits you. It, it feels safe in the moment, but even when you hate it, it kind of feels safe. Like you just don't <laughs> yeah. know, you don't know what to do about it. And, um, and sometimes it takes, I think, you know, the, grace of God before something changes, you know? And something that, especially at least for me, maybe for most men that just falls off the radar, out of sight, out of mind, um, is uh, eating disorders. We don't, I, I don't even consider that. Like when I think of addictions, I never think of eating disorders. And that got brought up recently by a guest and it's like, oh yeah. So that's a terrible one as well. I, I, I had an eating disorder undiagnosed in college and yes, very addictive, very ritualistic, very um limiting control it's all about control you're out you're literally out of control but you think you're in control right 
right? Which is the classic, I can quit anytime, right? That's, it's just with food. Yeah. You know, using food in a way that's not what it's intended for. And um, yeah. And, and sometimes it's, you know, for me, kind of coming out of the, out of the um, eating disorder was, I wanted, I was in college and I wanted to do a year in England. Like I had this, and I realized in the back of my mind that if I kept up what I was doing, I wasn't going to be able to do it. Right. And that was the thing. I needed that other thing that became more important to come in and go, you want to really sabotage this? And I was like, all right. And then it, it morphed, you know, I still kind of had it, but I, it's, it broke, I think a little of the, the ritual and you know it poke through yeah you realize there's something else that you know this goal that i need to achieve now this yeah. is the question i haven't asked in several episodes i was asking it a lot during like 2020 when everything looked like i was going to hell but <laughs> i haven't asked it much recently but i feel like it's an appropriate question here to kind of put a ball on things with as many people as you've talked to and through your line of work and you know just the different interactions you have not at work in your facebook group are you overall more optimistic or pessimistic about the world right now? Optimistic. I thought so. You optimistic. seem like a very optimistic person. I, I am by nature, but and it's easy to go into the pessimism, and I totally understand why people do that. But it depends on energy your level you're at. So yeah. if you're at the energy level of, and I think you need to go through these kind of different energy levels. There's one. There's a an energy level where you're the veil has been removed. And you're seeing how the sausage is made. And it's, and I was in that for five years where every day I was like a new hero fell off the, pe you know, the pedestal. Yeah. I was like, you too? Oh my God. <laughs> oh, and that person, oh, and they go to this meeting, oh, and they're getting bribed by the, oh, <laughs> you know. And it can be very depressing and distressing. And I, I saw a lot of things that flipped me out. And I kept saying, where are we going with this? Right. You're just like, this is, you know, we've been living with this and now it's, you know, it's the, it's the, the blister or the wound coming up and it gets really, really ugly. Yeah. And, um, and then seeing that like nothing really changes, that's part of that too, is that's part of it. This person is obviously guilty of this and yet nothing's happening. You know, it sits on that board somehow. Right, right. <laughs> somehow uh, the evidence got lost. So well, that person mysteriously died, you know, and, and no one's asking questions and you're like, am I the only one who's noticing this? So you could stay at that level. And I tell you, it's a very exciting to, level to be at because you're constantly discovering new atrocities. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can certainly spend a lot of time digging those up. And, yeah. and there's so many shows now that talk about, I've noticed that it went from like fringe. There was like a fringe talking about it. And now it's coming into the mainstream where more and more people are talking about more and more things. Yes. Um, and there's still that veneer of everything's very normal here. You know, there's still yeah. that, but that's thinning out. Less people are paying attention to that. Indeed. But what I've noticed is that I'm usually a little ahead. Not that I'm special, but I've no, just yeah. noticed I've gone through my five period, five years of, of um, suffering and gnashing of teeth and and going, oh, my God, is this really our world? And by the grace of God, I'll write about it in the new book. I was able to level up a couple of times. I kind of went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Right. And now I'm just kind of this like whatever is going to happen is going to happen. But we're all going to be somehow OK. And if not, we'll die. And that's OK, too. I'm very. You know what I mean? Like, yes, if it's supposed to happen, it'll happen. But I think as I see more and more people realizing this part, I realize, OK, they're going to eventually go up here or die, whatever. They'll eventually pop up yep. at some point or enough people will. So and then, of course, when you're at that level, you start meeting people at that level. So, yeah, I'm meeting more people at sort of the miracle level, you know, which is fun. It is and sometimes fun. I dip down. I, you know, watch something and I'll go, ooh, and I'll go, all right, it's cool. All right. Just dipping in, just seeing. All right. Where we are. OK, let's go back up here. 
I have to agree, and for the exact same reasons. I think people are tuning out of the mainstream stuff. They're seeking out their own information. Sometimes it's very toxic, and as long as those things are kept in the light and not in the darkness where we can all scrutinize it and all make those people not realize anything but influence them and not force anything but say, hey, this is what you think. Well, this is why I think differently, and then we can both come together and see who makes more sense rather than you know shouting and I, I I agree. I think the independent news media now is it's fantastic. Um, all the different YouTube channels. It seems like a fire hose, and it is. But also, it's been great for information. It's been great for people seeking out stuff that makes them happy. Yeah, and I love watching the what people consider polar opposites coming together and going. Wait, you you agree with me? Yeah. Oh my god. Wait, we both think this is completely bullshit. <laughs> oh my god, I thought you were so ignorant and horrible. You know. I love watching because I, I will I would watch the left and the right. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like, you guys are both talking about the same thing. Maybe you have different solutions to the problem, but you're kind of talking about the same thing. Oh yeah. And then you see them come together and you're like, yes. <laughs> it's fun to watch. It's it's amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. Rita Denoyo Garcia. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I had no idea I was going to have this much fun. I would love to speak to you again if you're available in the future. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Dylan. This is, was a lot of fun. It's a good way Thank to you spend so your Saturday morning. Yes. I, I never know what to expect. I get so nervous before these things because you just <laughs> you don't know. And once I hop on, I, I've i never had a bad experience on one of these. So I, I try to remember that as I sign on and think it's going to be fine. And it certainly was. Um, I hope everyone goes on to, if you wouldn't mind plugging yourself, all the places you're available and the books and the YouTube channel. So uh, becomingawake.com is my website. Then I have a Becoming Awake YouTube site. I have a Facebook group for women called the Calm Mom Alliance. And then, of course, you can get the Self-Compassion Project on Amazon, Goodreads, uh, Barnes & Noble, and, of course, my website. Excellent. Rita, Tanaya Garcia, thank you again so much. I will be ending this live broadcast right now.